all right so a very good evening everyone so in the today's session i'll be doing a quick recap of emergencies in pulmonology so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator So now, there are two important emergencies in the pulmonology. <clears throat> the two important emergencies in pulmonology, they include number one, sudden onset dyspnea and the other important emergency is the hemoptysis. So these are the two important emergencies which we come across in the pulmonology. So what I will do first, I will discuss what are all the various causes of dyspnea and then I will tell you which are the which are the causes for sudden onset dyspnea followed by that i will discuss about the hemoptysis so these are the two important emergencies with which a patient of pulmonary disorder will come to the casualty so now you take up the etiologies that will be causing dyspnea if you take the etiologies that causing dyspnea they include number one the airway obstruction can cause dyspnea Next, pulmonary parenchymal disorders can cause dyspnea, pleural disorders can cause dyspnea, chest wall disorders can cause dyspnea, decreased lung volume due to interference with the chest expansion can cause dyspnea. So these are all the various etiologies which will be causing dyspnea. Now let me first tell you about the conditions that is airway obstruction causing dyspnea. So if you take the airway obstruction causing dyspnea, these are all the airway obstruction which will cause dyspnea that is foreign body presence of a tumor or malignancy in the airway angioedema infections then tracheomalacia tracheal stenosis and bronchiectasis but out of this the two conditions which will present with sudden onset dyspnea is the foreign body aspiration into the airway and then angioedema these are the two important conditions of airway obstruction which will present with sudden onset dyspnea. I will discuss both of them. Then coming to the pulmonary parenchymal disorders. There are many pulmonary parenchymal disorders which will cause dyspnea. That includes asthma, COPD, trauma, pulmonary edema, atelectasis, pulmonary fibrosis, occupational lung disorders like coal workers pneumoconiosis, ARDS, rheumatological disorders like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, hematological conditions like or hemorrhagic conditions like good pasture syndrome, like uh, any malignancy within the lung parenchyma. But out of these, which conditions will present with sudden onset dyspnea, which will be a pulmonary emergency? Asthma will present with and that too it should be acute exacerbation of asthma, then acute exacerbation of COPD, then pulmonary contusion or pulmonary hemorrhage non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema which is nothing but ARDS and then lung atelectasis. These are the pulmonary parenchymal pathologies which can present with sudden onset dyspnea and that will be the pulmonary emergency. Then we have the pleural disorders which can present with sudden onset dyspnea. But first of all what are all the various pleural causes for dyspnea that includes trauma to the chest then spontaneous pneumothorax, which is atraumatic, infections like empyema pyothorax, chylothorax, pleural effusion, pleural adhesion, and pleural tumor. But which conditions will present with sudden onset dyspnea, which will be a pulmonary emergency for you? These are the causes for sudden onset dyspnea of pleural origin, that is trauma to the chest and as well as the pneumothorax. And this trauma to the chest, it can cause tension pneumothorax or it can also cause even hemothorax. Then we have some chest wall disorders which can present with dyspnea. But out of which, okay, these are all the chest wall disorders which can present with dyspnea. That is trauma to the chest wall like fractured ribs, flail chest, bony abnormalities like pectus excavatum and kyphoscoliosis. But which of the following conditions will present with sudden onset dyspnea like fractured ribs or chest wall injury? Then lastly we have decreased lung volume due to interference with the chest expansion. What are those conditions? 
these are all the conditions which can cause decreased lung volume due to interference with lung expansion where the individual will present with dyspnea abdominal distension abdominal mass diaphragmatic injury ruptured diaphragm and paralysis of the diaphragm so out of which which one what are the conditions which will present with sudden onset dyspnea these are the conditions like diaphragmatic injury ruptured diaphragm and paralysis of diaphragm they will present with sudden onset dyspnea now now let me take up individual conditions how will you how the condition will present what are the signs how do you do the work up and what is the specific treatment all that we will discuss now first important condition which is one of the most important condition is nothing but acute exacerbation of copd these patients they present with sudden onset dyspnea that is nothing but shortness of breath along with the shortness of breath they can also have right they can also have the wheezing right they also present with wheeze right then i'm sorry then these individuals they can also have the pleuritic chest pain so these are the classic symptoms of acute exacerbation of copd and what is the precipitating factor for the development of acute exacerbation in a case of copd most common cause will be infection of the lung parenchyma and what do you think will be the signs of the acute exacerbation of copd they will have respiratory distress so there will be tachypnea where the respiratory rate will be more than 30 per minute and when you auscultate you will have a wheeze and if you take inspiration to the expiration ratio inspiratory component will be more than compared to that of the expiratory component so there will be prolonged right there will be prolonged inspiration to the expiration ratio and how will be the breath sounds there will be decreased breath sounds particularly in case of emphysema the breath sounds will be reduced and how do you do the work up of acute exacerbation of copd so you need to do a chest x ray what is that you will rule out in the chest x ray you have to rule out the pneumonia because i have said you that infection is one of the most common precipitating factor for acute exacerbation of copd so you have to rule out the pneumonia okay or you need to rule out any other pneumothorax why because we have paraseptal emphysema these patients with paraseptal emphysema they can develop spontaneous pneumothorax due to which there can be sudden onset dyspnea in a case of patient with the copd then what is the specific treatment that you will be giving in these patients first and foremost the oxygen supplementation right oxygen supplementation so this oxygen supplementation you have to start and you have to keep low fio2 low fraction of inspired oxygen in order to see that that respiratory drive is being present and what are the drugs that you will be giving that is the beta 2 agonist that is salbutamol and terbutalin can be given then anticholinergic drugs that is ipratropium bromide or thiotropium bromide and next the steroids have to be supplemented so this will be the medical management in spite of medical management if the patient dyspnea or saturation is not improving then you have to connect the patient to non invasive positive pressure ventilation right you have to connect the patient to non invasive positive pressure ventilation and in spite of non invasive positive pressure ventilation if the patient is not improving then in such case you need to do intubation right endotracheal tube you need to place so this is about your acute exacerbation of copd and overall if you take copd as such copd what is the most common risk factor for development of copd that is smoking and how do you calculate the smoking we calculate that in the form of pack years that is packs of cigarette per day multiplied by number of years that is smoking is one of the very very important risk factor 
followed by that mutation of certain genes like serpina 1 gene which can cause alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency so this gene mutation is also one of the risk factor for the development of COPD and exposure to fumes and chemicals can also increase the risk of COPD and even environmental pollution can also increase the risk of COPD and this will be the chest x-ray in patients with emphysema right this will be the chest x-ray in patients with the emphysema where you have bilaterally enlarged lung fields right and because of this bila bilaterally enlarged lung fields right basically why do you have that bilaterally enlarged lung fields because emphysema is a disorder which is characterized by abnormal irreversible dilatation of the lungs and this enlarged lungs will overlap the heart and that is the reason why the heart it appears as the vertical heart or the tubular heart and this enlarged lungs will compress the diaphragm thereby the individual will develop or uh, the individual will have what is called a low set diaphragm so that is about your the emphysema chest x-ray and another important component in COPD is chronic bronchitis so chronic bronchitis what will be the chest x-ray findings is there will be increased bronchovascular markings so that will be the chest x-ray findings in patients with chronic bronchitis so this is about your how will you manage or how will you diagnose a case of acute exacerbation of COPD then another important pulmonary emergency where the individual can present with sudden onset dyspnea it is the airway obstruction right it is airway obstruction so whenever the airway obstruction is by either a foreign body or whatever might be the substance the individual will have a strider right if the obstruction is in the larger airways right if the obstruction is in the larger airways the individual will have a strider and the other important is they will have this sudden onset dyspnea and if the aspiration has occurred into the lungs right if the aspiration has occurred into the lungs then the individual can have a wheeze the difference between the strider and wheeze is that strider it is an inspiratory sound wheeze it is an expiratory sound so airway obstruction is one of the very very important pulmonary emergency where the individual can present with sudden onset dyspnea and what will be the signs in case of airway obstruction the individual will have respiratory distress respiratory rate will be more than 30 per minute the individual will be using accessory muscles for respiration and what will be the position of the patient right so the individual will be in sitting up and leaning forward to open the airway and that we call it as the tripod position right that we call it as the tripod position so this tripod position you know it helps in opening the airway so this is the characteristic i mean this will be the position of the individual with airway obstruction in order to see that the individual can take up more and more air then how do you do work up of this particular airway obstruction okay so if the individual is unstable right if the individual is unstable and unstable means what there is tachypnea tachycardia and desaturation so you need to secure the airway right you need to secure the airway and once the individual is stabilized then how will you diagnose what is that airway obstruction either we do a laryngoscope or laryngoscopy or we do a ct scan of the neck or you can do the chest x-ray i mean sorry the x-ray of the tissues of the neck and you also need to do you need to take an ent consultation as well to look for the obstruction then what is the specific treatment first and foremost the oxygen supplementation then you need to secure the airway what do you mean by the word secure the airway that is you need to intubate the patient right you need to intubate the patient the other methods of the securing the airway is the cricothyroidotomy can be done right and if intubation is not possible through endotracheal tube then 
securing the airway should be done by the tracheostomy right the securing the airway should be done by the tracheostomy next now one condition where the individual can develop the airway obstruction is by angioedema now this angioedema is secondary to an allergic reaction right it is secondary to an allergic reaction so in that case what you have to do is you need to give aerosolized epinephrine right you need to give aerosolized epinephrine if there is angioedema causing airway obstruction and the very important methodology of the treatment is you need to remove the foreign body okay so this is about your airway obstruction presenting as a pulmonary emergency right and this will be the classical symptoms signs workup and specific treatment then after airway obstruction another important quick recap right another important quick recap is about the asthma it is about the asthma so asthma that too it is an acute exacerbation of asthma that those patients they can present with sudden onset dyspnea right along with the sudden onset dyspnea the individual will also have wheeze and chest pain right the individual will also have wheeze and chest pain so this will be the classic symptomatology in case of acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and what will happen to the respiratory rate it is increased where the individual will have tachypnea and there will be prolonged inspiration to the expiration ratio and on auscultation you will have a wheeze right and if the bronchoconstriction is very severe then the individual will have a silent chest what do you mean by the word silent chest that is because the airway obstruction is so severe that air is unable to enter into the lung then you get this silent chest we have a clinical entity called status asthmaticus which is a very severe form of asthma in these patients with status asthmaticus they have a characteristic pulse that is called pulses paradoxes so that will be the signs in case of acute exacerbation of the bronchial asthma then coming to the workup so one important form of the workup is the peak expiratory flow rate right you need to do spirometry the peak expiratory flow rate it is pre and post treatment that is mainly to compare you need to do that peak expiratory flow rate but the individual is in a state of sudden onset dyspnea in order to do this peak expiratory flow rate the patient may or may not cooperate okay but peak expiratory flow rate is one of the methodology if the patient cooperates in doing the workup of acute exacerbation of the bronchial asthma so you need to do pre and as well as post treatment to compare so along with the oxen therapy what is the drug of choice the drug of choice will be short acting beta agonist that is your salbutamol should be given then intravenous hydrocortisone should be given this corticosteroids what is the use they will improve the efficacy of your beta 2 agonist and the other see what is the very important precipitating factor for the development of acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma is the infections so in the treatment you also need to give antimicrobials that is mainly to counter this precipitating factor that is infection and in spite of medical management if the patient does not respond right patient does not respond then in such case the patient has to be connected to non invasive positive pressure ventilation and if the non invasive positive pressure ventilation does not work then the patient has to be placed on mechanical ventilator with endotracheal tube that is intubation has to be done so this is about how to work up a case of acute exacerbation of the bronchial asthma okay right then another important pulmonary emergency will be the pneumothorax right another important pulmonary emergency will be pneumothorax so this pneumothorax which is developing secondary to trauma that will be the tension pneumothorax secondary to trauma will be tension pneumothorax 
and apart from trauma if the individual develops pneumothorax that could be a spontaneous pneumothorax and this spontaneous pneumothorax it can occur secondary to paraseptal emphysema or this spontaneous pneumothorax this primary spontaneous pneumothorax can also occur in tall thin male smokers right or in those individuals with connective tissue disorders like marfans they also can develop the primary spontaneous pneumothorax and even trauma can cause this tension pneumothorax then what will be the classical symptoms in case of pneumothorax that is abrupt onset dyspnea along with that the individual will have also have the pleuritic chest pain so that will be the presentation in case of the pneumothorax and if you take the signs on examination like on percussion you will have the hyper resonant note right on percussion you will have the hyper resonant note okay and if it is spontaneous pneumothorax then you will have decreased breath sounds or there will be absent breath sounds right and what will happen to your vocal fremitus or vocal resonance both of them will be reduced or absent and if it is tension pneumothorax then what will be the breath sounds you have amphoric type of bronchial breath sounds what do you mean by the word amphoric type of bronchial breath sounds it is nothing but the breath sounds which are of metallic quality the breath sounds which are of metallic quality that will be the signs in case of the pneumothorax and how will you diagnose this patients with the pneumothorax that is by your chest x ray what does the chest x ray shows see the chest x ray will show you the presence of the hyperlucent lung fields hmm? chest x ray will show you the presence of the hyperlucent lung fields and you will also notice that there is collapse of the lung right and you will also notice that the mediastinum or the trachea it is being shifted to the opposite side right the trachea has been shifted to the opposite side so this will be the chest x ray picture in patients with the pneumothorax then what will be the specific treatment the specific treatment is these patients have to be given 100% oxygen and then the tube thoracostomy has to be done right tube thoracostomy has to be done see whenever you are doing the tube thoracostomy where you have to insert the tube the tube thoracostomy the tube has to be inserted in fifth or sixth intercostal space mid axillary line right fifth or sixth intercostal space in the mid axillary line whereas in case of tension pneumothorax right in case of a tension pneumothorax you need to do a large bore needle insertion right you need to do a large bore needle insertion so this where will you do this large bore needle insertion this large bore needle insertion should be done in the second intercostal space anteriorly now this will be little controversial point but this particular point is given in the harrison okay so in which intercostal space you need to insert this large bore needle in the second anterior intercostal space this is what is the sentence which is given in the 21st edition of the harrison under the topic of tension pneumothorax okay right some of the books they have given like wide bore needle insertion should be done in the fifth but according to the standard textbook that is harrison if you take it is in the second anterior intercostal space you need to do large bore needle insertion in case of the tension pneumothorax and this needle should be placed until tube thoracostomy can be inserted until tube thoracostomy is inserted the needle has to be placed in the space okay so that is about your pneumothorax which is a pulmonary emergency and one important chest x ray finding in case of the tension pneumothorax that you need to know is right one important finding that you need to know is the deep sulcus sign right deep sulcus sign when will you get this particular deep sulcus sign deep sulcus sign you get this in patients with pneumothorax when you take the x ray 
right? When you take the X-ray of patients with pneumothorax in supine position, then you get this particular deep sulcus sign, which is a very, very important question. Now, after having discussed about pneumothorax as one of the very important pulmonary emergency, the next important topic let me discuss is about the pulmonary embolism, right? So pulmonary embolism, the presentation will be the same. That is the sudden onset dyspnea. And this sudden onset dyspnea is very common in case of massive pulmonary embolism. And if it is a small pulmonary embolism that can cause pulmonary infarction causing chest pain and it will be a very sharp pleuritic type of chest pain right it will be very sharp pleuritic type of chest pain and if there is massive pulmonary embolism the individual can develop significant hypotension and because of hypotension the individual can have the syncopal attack and because of pulmonary infarction that infarcted lung parenchyma can irritate the airway which can cause the cough. So this is about the pulmonary embolism presentation. And what will be the signs? There will be respiratory distress. Respiratory rate is increased. The heart rate will be increased more than 100 per minute. There will be hypotension. right? And when you auscultate the second heart sound, you will have a loud P2. And why is that? That is because of development of pulmonary hypertension, right? That is because of development of pulmonary hypertension. And there can be even leg swelling. But when will you have this leg swelling? If the patient has the DVT, right? If the patient has DVT, then they can have this leg swelling. So this is about your signs that you will have in case of pulmonary embolism. Then how do you do this workup? So, one you need to do the D dimer, but this D dimer it is non specific. And what is the investigation of choice? That is the CT chest and that to contrast enhanced CT chest. But if the CT chest is equivocal or doubtful, then the gold standard investigation will be CT pulmonary angiography that will be the gold standard it will be therapeutic and as well as even diagnostic as well which one ct pulmonary angiography and the pregnant females and all we cannot do contrast enhanced uh, ct scan ct scan is like radiation in pregnant females so in them you can do a vp scan ventilation perfusion scan then what will be the specific treatment oxygen therapy is first and for example if the individual has significant hypotension and there is also right ventricular failure, in this case, you need to do thrombolysis with tissue plasminogen activator or altiplase, retiplase or tenecteplase. But for suppose, if the individual is not having hypotension or not having right ventricular failure, but pulmonary embolism is there, then in such case, anticoagulation should be done. Right, in such case, anticoagulation has to be done. So this is about your pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism I have discussed in detail even in case of the cardiac emergencies as well, right? So you can just go back to my session on cardiac emergencies where I have done a detailed discussion on pulmonary embolism. Then next important, next important pulmonary emergency will be the pleural effusion. But remember, pleural effusion as such, they don't present with a uh, sudden onset dyspnea. But if there is development of hemothorax, right? If there is development of hemothorax secondary to chest trauma, right? Secondary to chest trauma. In this case, the pleural effusion patients can present with sudden onset dyspnea, right? So there will be history of trauma to the chest. Okay, some road traffic accident or any blunt injury over the chest. So they can present with the hemothorax. And what do you think will be the signs? Definitely the trachea will be shifted to the opposite side, right? And what will happen to the your uh, uh, percussion note? You will have the stony dull note, right? Stony dull note. Okay, and what will happen to the breath sounds? Breath sounds will be reduced. 
and how do you do the workup the workup is done by the chest x-ray and what does the chest x-ray shows see this will be the chest x-ray in a case of a pleural effusion or even in case of hemothorax first and foremost there will be blunting of the costophrenic angle and you will have the presence of the homogeneous opacity right you will have the presence of the homogeneous opacity and if you observe the trachea the trachea it is shifted to the opposite side right the trachea is shifted to the opposite side and you also have the presence of a curve and this particular curve it is the ls s shaped curve right this particular curve it is ls s shaped curve okay then how do you treat these patients with a hemothorax see these patients with hemothorax you have to treat by a tube thoracostomy and this tube thoracostomy has to be done in the fifth or sixth intercostal space in the mid axillary line so this is about as such pleural effusion they present with gradual onset dyspnea right they present with gradual onset dyspnea but if it is hemothorax secondary to trauma they can present with sudden onset dyspnea right and what is the most common cause of pleural effusion as such congestive cardiac failure most common cause of transudative type of pleural effusion congestive cardiac failure most common cause of exudative type of pleural effusion pneumonia followed by the tuberculosis and in case of exudative you need to remember about the lights criteria which is very important lights criteria uh, what are the three important features in lights criteria in exudative the pleural fluid pleural fluid protein should be more than 3 grams per deciliter then the pleural fluid protein to the serum protein ratio should be more than 0.5 that is second and third is the pleural fluid ldh to the serum ldh should be more than 0.6 so these three are your lights criteria features okay and out of these three if one is present we consider it as exudative type of pleural effusion so this is about like pleural effusion how it can present with sudden onset dyspnea then then another important pulmonary emergency which can present with sudden onset dyspnea is ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome so the patient will be having sudden onset dyspnea and what is the most common cause of ARDS most common cause of ARDS will be sepsis whereas most common cause of direct lung injury causing ARDS most common cause of direct lung injury causing ARDS that will be pneumonia whereas most common cause of indirect lung injury right most common cause of indirect lung injury causing ARDS that will be sepsis right that will be sepsis so the classic symptomatology is what that is sudden onset dyspnea then what will be the signs in these individuals see whenever you auscultate right you can have the bilateral crepts and there will be decreased breath sounds can be there and when you do a workup right in the workup like what you will do is the chest x-ray and as well as the abg arterial blood gas analysis so chest x-ray what is that you will observe it will be diffuse bilateral white out lung right diffuse bilateral opacities will be there so that will be the chest x-ray in patients with the ARDS and ABG the individual will have type 1 respiratory failure but in very severe form of ARDS right in very severe form of ARDS they can progress to the development of type 2 respiratory failure as well but whereas in mild to moderate it is your type 1 respiratory failure where there is hypoxemia and as well as hypocapnia but when very severe form along with hypoxia there will be hypercapnia as well then in case of ARDS you need to know the name of the criteria also the name of the criteria is the Berlin's criteria that is what is the criteria in case of ARDS now according to this Berlin's criteria right uh, there are four important features and I just will tell you this in the form of a mnemonic and the mnemonic is ARDS itself a stands for acute onset okay the onset of the symptoms will be in acute in onset that is 
within one week of clinical insult there will be development of symptoms r stands for reduced pao2 by fio2 right and how much this will be this will be less than 200 d stands for diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray right diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray and f stands for actually your ARDS is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be absolutely normal in ARDS and how will you uh, measure this pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that is with the help of a swan gans catheter so swan gans catheter shows you that there is normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that is less than 18 millimeters of mercury so that is what is your berlin's criteria now depending upon your pao2 by fio2 we also classify that into mild moderate severe right if pao2 by fio2 right if pao2 by fio2 if it is in between 200 to 300 it is mild if it is in between 100 to 200 it is moderate and if it is less than 100, it is considered to be a very severe form of ARDS. And this will be the chest X-ray in patients with the ARDS, where it is considered as a white out lung. Why? Because you have bilateral diffuse opacities. Right? Bilateral diffuse opacities. Okay? And then, how do you treat these patients with the ARDS? So definitely yes, oxygen supplementation is very much mandatory. But with the help of oxygen mask itself, it does not suffice. These patients have to be placed on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And if it does not suffice, then you need to put the patient on mechanical ventilator with endotracheal tube. Now, the uh, ventilator parameters are very important in the management. So the tidal volume first of all. So the tidal volume it should be low tidal volume. It is 6 ml per kg is the tidal volume in case of the ARDS patient. Then the PEEP. The PEEP should be of adequate PEEP. It should be around 10 centimeters of water. And the purpose of the PEEP is mainly to open the collapsed alveoli in patients with the ARDS. And what should be the position of the patient? The position of the patient should be the prone position. So this is about your ARDS which can present with a sudden onset dyspnea which is one of the pulmonary emergency. See these are some of the expected pulmonary emergencies that can be asked in your exam. Next important pulmonary emergency is what? That is the hemoptysis. Right? And that too if it is mild or moderate hemoptysis they don't present to the emergency department. Right? If there is massive hemoptysis or if there is life-threatening hemoptysis then only the patient will present to the casualty with the complaint saying that there is massive coughing out of the blood. When will you call life-threatening hemoptysis or massive hemoptysis? See within 24 hours if 400 ml of blood has been coughed out or expected it out we call it as massive hemoptysis or if the amount of blood which is being coughed out, right, or if the amount of blood which is being coughed out is around 100 to 150 ml at one time, okay, if the amount of blood which is coughed out is around 100 to 150 ml at one time, then also we call it as life-threatening hemoptysis. And if the question is asked, like, what do you think is the most common cause of hemoptysis? right that is tuberculosis but if the question is asked what is the most common cause of the massive hemoptysis then it will be bronchiectasis and what is the most common cause of the bronchiectasis most common cause of bronchiectasis is recurrent infection like pneumonia followed by that the tuberculosis that will be the most common cause of massive hemoptysis and in a case of patient with hemoptysis what could be the cause of death what could be the cause of death in a patient with the hemoptysis the cause of death in a case of patient with hemoptysis is asphyxiation right so risk of death due to asphyxiation and this particular asphyxiation 
is from blood filling the airways and air spaces that can cause asphyxiation and can cause the death of the individual and how do you do the workup see definitely yes chest x-ray we can do chest x-ray what it will show you like it will show you if there is any like opacity and all but that will not give you exact site of bleeding right which side the pathology is there that can be said by your chest x-ray but where exactly is the site of bleeding that cannot be said by your chest x-ray and when you do a ct scan ct scan also will tell you right where is the tumor size of the tumor but the point from where the bleeding is coming cannot be said by even your ct scan also what you have to do is investigation of choice for localizing the site of bleeding that will be ct angiography right ct angiography so ct angiography uh, that helps in localizing where exactly is the active extravasation now let me just tell you how will you do the workup in case of the massive hemoptysis so now this is a table which is directly taken from the harrison a patient with hemoptysis right which is non massive and then massive hemoptysis when will you call massive hemoptysis when the amount of blood which has been expectorated out is around 400 ml per 24 hours or in one time if the individual expectorates out around 100 to 150 ml then we call it as massive hemoptysis first important thing is you need to protect the airway right and if the bleeding stops well and good and if the bleeding continues then you need to do the embolization or the resection first and foremost thing comes now what exactly you mean by this word protecting the airway what you mean by this word protecting the airway see protecting the airway is nothing but in case of massive hemoptysis you should be able to make out from which side the bleeding is coming see you cannot uh, uh, just by the history itself you cannot tell from where exactly is the site of bleeding which side the bleeding is there from the history you cannot tell right you need to do the examination right that is your uh, the inspection auscultation and as well as the percussion and possibly an emergency chest x-ray by doing the examination and emergency chest x-ray you will be able to make out from where exactly the bleeding is coming so protecting the airway and protecting the non bleeding lung right protecting the non bleeding lung is very much important in the management of massive hemoptysis because asphyxiation can happen quickly so if the site of bleeding is known the patient should be positioned with the bleeding side down so for suppose if right side pathology is there so the individual has to be made to lie down in the right lateral position okay the individual has to be made to lie down in the right lateral position why so that due to gravity the blood will pull up in the affected side so that the non bleeding lung is completely secured so that the asphyxiation does not occur so on whichever side the bleeding side is there you just try to position the patient with the bleeding side down to use the gravitational advantage okay and mostly this endotracheal intubation right endotracheal intubation should be avoided right it should be avoided unless necessary why it should be avoided since the suctioning through the endotracheal tube is a less effective means of removing the blood it is not effective means of removing the blood if at all if intubation is required right if at all if intubation is required you need to protect the non bleeding lung so what you have to do you have to do selective intubation of non bleeding lung that is what you have to do okay if at all if you want to do intubation right then followed by that controlling the bleeding see the most 
life threatening cases of hemoptysis they arise from the bronchial artery circulation whenever there is bronchial artery rupture right whenever there is bronchial artery rupture then there can be massive hemoptysis causing life threatening hemoptysis so what will be the treatment of choice in case of the bronchial artery rupture causing massive hemoptysis you need to do a bronchial artery embolization right you need to do bronchial artery embolization that is a procedure of choice for controlling the bleeding but only one important point you have to think is bronchial artery embolization can have significant complications such as embolization of anterior spinal artery so you need to be very careful regarding the embolization of anterior spinal artery okay then the other important methodology of controlling the bleeding is the surgical resection right the other important methodology is surgical resection the surgical resection it has a high mortality rate the mortality rate in surgical resection is up to 15 to 40 percent so until unless required surgical resection should not be done so who are the ideal candidate for surgery the ideal candidate for surgery are those individuals who have a localized parenchymal disease those are these individuals are the ideal candidates for doing the surgical resection and thereby controlling the bleeding so this is about your massive hemoptysis so what are the two important pulmonary emergencies with which the patient can present to the emergency department sudden onset dyspnea and hemoptysis so please remember airway obstruction causing sudden onset dyspnea will be foreign body aspiration and angioedema lung pathologies causing sudden onset dyspnea will be acute exacerbation of asthma acute exacerbation of copd pulmonary contusion pulmonary hemorrhage and non cardiogenic pulmonary edema the pleural causes causing sudden onset dyspnea will be the tension pneumothorax hemothorax and spontaneous pneumothorax the chest wall conditions causing sudden onset dyspnea will be fractured rib this fractured rib can cause the tension pneumothorax or any chest wall injury causing the fracture of the ribs can cause the pneumothorax where the individual can present with sudden onset dyspnea then decreased lung volume due to interference with the chest expansion causing sudden onset dyspnea will be diaphragmatic injury ruptured diaphragm or paralysis of the diaphragm so this completes your quick recap of the pulmonary emergencies so with this we will wind up this particular session and in the upcoming sessions we will discuss the emergencies in the neurology emergencies in the nephrology emergencies in the connective tissue disorders and the toxicology emergencies so these are the subsequent topics which we will be discussing okay so thank you very much see you in the upcoming sessions